I'm delighted to be here today to uh, have a conversation with Professor John Warner. John Warner is a distinguished professor of green chemistry in a fractional appointment here at Monash University. And John, along with his colleague and friend, Professor Paul Anastas, are the co-founders of the Green Chemistry Principles, which is really a way of thinking about how we do chemistry in the future. And John, welcome today, and I'm um, really pleased to have you here, here at Monash in one of your visits that you do make occasionally in your role as Distinguished Professor here at Monash. So um, I'd love to hear from you about green chemistry, because we know chemistry is very much part of everyday life for everyone. Everything we have comes from chemistry, chemical manufacture. And I know green chemistry and the thinking behind green chemistry is going to really make a great impact. And of course, we've got this course, Master of Green Chemistry and Sustainable Technologies, which you teach into. And uh, the students really enjoy having your contribution and we've uh, very much benefited from having you as part of that. So John, I'd just like to ask you, you now green chemistry, you know, how is it going to make a great difference to the future in our world? Hello Tony, it's a pleasure to be here at Monash University. I'm very proud to be a member of the faculty here and the first university in the Southern Hemisphere to sign the green chemistry commitment, which is a critical uh, red letter uh, accomplishment. So very proud to be here and to support this amazing faculty. Chemistry in our society is everywhere. And I think this is something that people don't fully appreciate, that they wake up in the morning and the air they breathe is chemistry. The clothes that they're wearing is chemistry. The materials that they use to wash their hair and wash their face and brush their teeth is chemistry. The food that they eat is chemistry. Chemistry is anything that you can touch, that you can interact with in the physical world is chemistry. Now, the chemical industry has evolved over the last several decades to provide society with desperately needed materials. We are now curing diseases that were certainly fatal decades ago. We are feeding the hungry, that, that people worldwide hunger has decreased because of the use of chemical materials. That poverty is people being lifted out of poverty because of chemistry. It is hands down that our global society is successful by and large because of the accomplishments of chemistry. But at the same time, if one opens up a newspaper, turns on the radio, looks on the internet, we hear about global climate change, we hear about pollution, we hear about toxicity, we hear about plastics in the ocean, and we're inundated with this negative uh, impacts of chemistry, which is well deserved. There are some things that are going wrong in chemistry, but sometimes we lose sight of the fact that we need these chemical products at the same time. So how would it be possible to have these desperately needed things that keep our civilization fair and equitable, but at the same time not cause these negative impacts like global climate change and plastics in the ocean? That is the definition of green chemistry is the science to enable us to invent these very needed technologies while doing it in a way that doesn't cause these negative impacts. There are so many people in the world striving to promote climate change, you know, and to, to defend the world from climate change. We want to have policies. We want to have ways of getting people to change their behavior. We want to stem plastics in the ocean. We want to stem pollution. All of these very noble, worthwhile goals that people all around the, every aspect of civilization is working on are critical. However, the only path forward to achieve any of these successful goals is through the invention of new technologies. And that is the sole domain of chemistry. So without inventing these new successful technologies, we're lost. And so green chemistry is that conduit that connects the inventive field of chemistry and material science to the greater sustainability community so that we can work hand in hand to achieve these goals. Oh, thank you. And, and would you say, therefore, the benefits beyond the immediate items, the goods that we take for granted in everyday life, there's a lot greater benefits that come out of 
doing things using green chemistry principles, the way we manufacture things and so forth. What are the other benefits you see in the broader sense? So when people think of the concept of sustainability, rightly so, they immediately go to environmentalism and things like climate change and things like that, which are critical, which are fundamental to the field of sustainability. But what people don't often recognize is that there's also economic sustainability. When you look at, let, when you look at a country like Australia, and you look at its relationship to global chemical industry, you say, wow, Australia is all alone, it's far away, it's not in touch with the global chemical industry and things like that. And oftentimes that's looked as a burden, that's looked at as a disadvantage. Sustainability flips that on its ear because now Australia has a competitive advantage, not in, in having traditional chemistry jobs, but inventing those new sustainable chemistry jobs that could be invented here in Australia to create jobs, to create an economy that shows the world how to be sustainable. All the pieces are in place here in Australia to literally lead the world in sustainability. And here in Monash, as an epicenter of green chemistry, is probably the place to be. And I think the role of education in this, and particularly we as chemists, and we teach chemistry in our degrees and so forth, I know you're a great advocate that there should be more of this right throughout the curricula. I'd be interested to hear your comments. I mean, we've got things happening at PhD level, we've got things happening in the master space. How far, how far should we go in this area with education? I'm going to do something I never do, and I'm going to be deeply personal, but I want to drive this, this point home. Right. When I was 27 years old, I had it made as a chemist. I had every award that you could possibly imagine. My face was on the cover of Celebrity Magazine. I already had 40, 50 patents. I had 40, 50 publications, got awards and everything. As a functioning chemist, I was probably one of the most successful functioning chemists on the planet for my age. My head was this big. I am the greatest scientist that ever lived and really was playing the game well when disaster hit and I lost my two-year-old son to a birth defect. My son John died of a disease called biliary atresia and lying in bed the night of my son's funeral I asked myself, I wonder if something I touched in the chemistry lab caused my son's birth defect. I wonder if heaven forbid something I received an award for caused my son's ultimate death. I didn't feel like some amazing scientist that was doing all kinds of I felt something was missing. I reflected upon my education, four years of undergraduate, four years of graduate school, and never once did I have a course that taught me how do you look at a molecule and predict whether it could be toxic or not? How do you look at a material and wonder how is it going to work in the environment? Will it persist or will it be causing pollution? How do you look at a process and say, is this going to contribute to climate change? And I realized that as a very successful chemist, this was 100% absent from my education. Now one could despair and say, oh, that's so terrible. But I actually look at this and say, oh my goodness, this is a reason for hope. If we change education and we include this knowledge in the education of the next generation of students, imagine what solutions they will have to some of these problems. So when you, again, hear about a red dye that causes cancer in lipstick or a plasticizer in packaging that causes birth defects and you say to yourself, why in the world would people invent materials that cause this harm? Well, if it's not part of their education, how could they not? But if you change education and you have this be a fundamental part of education, then all of a sudden everyone who has that class has the chance that maybe one day they invent a technology that hundreds of thousands of people they will never meet are no longer exposed to some hazardous material. That species of organisms that are on the verge of extinction will be saved because that material is no longer being released into the environment. What more powerful motivation for someone to, to dedicate their life into the field? 
but they can't do it just by wanting to do it. They can't dream of doing it without having the skills. So having education programs like here in Monash are critical to the future of society because we need people to not only want to invent these technologies, but actually have the skills to do so. Thanks, John. Thanks so much for sharing that personal uh, incident in your life and how that uh got you thinking, but now has all of us thinking and the impact of the principles of green chemistry and, and how we go forward for the future. Um, we hear a lot about circular economy nowadays. I'm just wondering what your view is on circular economy in the context of petroleum industry versus the bio-based economies that we hear are now emerging. Very important concept. So I want to do a thought experiment. Let's imagine tomorrow morning something happens overnight and everyone on the planet just said I want to do circular economy, I want to do sustainability. Every consumer insists on only using sustainable technologies. Every retailer insists on selling only sustainable technologies. Every brand only wants sustainable technologies. Every manufacturer only wants sustainable technologies. By my estimation we can do maybe 10-15% of these technologies today. Well over 70 to 80% have not been invented yet. People think that there's this epic battle of good and evil between industry and environmentalism and that this is a choice. But what it actually ends up being is, is an absence of that innovation. So from my perspective, the circular economy's challenge is a crisis of innovation. We need to invent that future. And to invent that future, we need people that have these skills. But we live in such a polarized society. We have people that, oh no, everything should be recycled. And someone else says, oh no, everything should be biodegradable and bio-based. Well, wait a minute, it's not that simple. We want both. We want biomaterials to be recycled. But, we want to use them over and over again. But inevitably, people are going to do the wrong thing and that material is going to get into the environment. So we want it to also be okay if it gets into the environment. We don't want to intentionally be throwing things in the environment, but we want to, our job as inventors of next generation materials shouldn't just be looking at everything happening the right way. But what we need to realize is that entropy happens, things go wrong. We need to invent technologies that are going to compensate and protect human health and the environment when things go wrong. Look what's happened in the United States. I don't know if the news has made it out here. Quite devastating, a train derailment in Ohio in which plumes and plumes of vinyl chloride and just devastating stuff. Okay, right now, the way the chemical industry works is we protect humans by mitigating exposure. We accept fundamentally that chemistry must be toxic, but that's okay. We'll put them in containers, we'll engineer ways to protect people. That works right up until the moment that it doesn't. But imagine if we had green chemistry for that technology, and instead of evacuating a five mile radius and people you know, being exposed to deadly things, people show up in gym shorts and t-shirts and they get a broom. If green chemistry has its way in the future, we have all these products without the associated risk. But if we f start with the position that chemistry has to be toxic, we will make that so. But if instead, with optimism, we say, well, what about a future where chemistry doesn't have to be harmful and toxic? We can invent that. It just ha takes the will and the ingenuity of the human spirit to do that. And that's why programs like here at Monash are so critical to train that next generation to pull that off. That leads me to think of something else. I know you, you uh, have the uh, Benon Behind nonprofit organization that you started with your wife, Amy Cannon. And, and the work it's doing, the green chemistry commitment that you mentioned that Monash is part of, how can we get the message of green chemistry out in the public arena? We, you've already told us about education, but how do we get it more public, particularly people understanding how important chemistry is in their lives? They don't have to be a chemist to get, get that message. 
society's relationship to chemistry is not very good because we hear about all these disasters, all these bad things, most people have a bad relationship with chemistry. You know, if I'm at a party with a mixed group of people and someone asks, what do you do? If I say I'm a chemist, that is a conversation stopper. You can hear a pin drop and, go, <gasps> and then everything goes on. So now, if I say I'm a molecular designer, they go, oh, how interesting. Okay, and so there, there is this semantic issue in the relationship between science and science. Statistics show that if a child does not have a positive experience with science by 12 years old, they will reject the sciences for the rest of their life. And so what we need to do is give these children in K through 12 in univer, uh, schools a positive experience. Don't have to worry about what is the lesson they learned, what is the you know, education outcomes of these experiences. They just need to be smiling from ear to ear saying, wow, that was cool. Now maybe when they learn and they become voters and, you know, and start buying products, they will have an awareness and have some ability to participate in that science. And so Beyond Benign is a nonprofit organization that looks at K through 12 education and looks at university education as the pipeline. You know, if you think about this need, this critical need to invent the future, then there is a supply chain of people with those skills. We need K through 12 to produce students that want to go to university, and then we want the universities to be providing the right skills to be able to invent. So Beyond Benign, the name, people say, what is the name Beyond Benign? Beyond Benign says we need to go beyond just being safe and non-toxic. We have to be successful in the marketplace. We have to have products that work better and cost better. So we must go beyond benign. And so Dr. Amy Cannon is this brilliant woman who has been pushing this thing. And right now there is the green chemistry commitment that asks universities to sign a commitment that says they're going to find a way to put green chemistry principles into the required curriculum. And there are over 110 universities worldwide who have signed this commitment. And Monash is the first university in the Southern Hemisphere to join this community of universities. John, thank you so much for what you've given us today. And uh, we're very happy to continue our work with you in the future in your role as Distinguished Professor of Green Chemistry here at Monash. Thank you. <laughs>